This episode is made possible by our Patreon supporters, Brie Alto, Julie Gray, Mary Jones, Jessica Smith, Kim Hokinson, Jan Elise Cannon, Jamie Lang, Jill Harrigan, Maria Carla Sanchez, Heather McKinnon, Valerie Jacobson, Chantel Oliver, Eric and Carolyn Shumway, Katrina and Kristen, Tamzane Weir, Caitlin McTaggart, and Lindsay Cummings. Hi, Katie. Hi, Olivia. It is October 6th, 1894, in Toronto, Canada, and a wealthy young white man named Frank Westwood has just been shot at his own front door. Ooh. We're in an episode of Murdoch Mysteries. Yes, we are. Ooh. So we are going true crime, folks. Victorian Canadian true crime. Perhaps he could solve it for us. Oh. Because we are about to encounter a mystery. Oh, boy. The sound of the shots brings Frank's mother running down the stairs where she finds her son clutching his stomach and saying, Mama, I've been shot. Multiple doctors are called in. They attempt to save him. But three agonizing days later, Ooh. Frank Westwood will die of blood poisoning. Ooh. Frank does live long enough to describe his assailant. He tells police that it was a middle-aged man with a mustache who was wearing a dark overcoat and who he did not recognize. Okay. So it may surprise our listeners, or it may not, to learn that six weeks or so later, the Toronto police will arrest a 33-year-old black woman who Frank knew extremely well. Interesting. Her name was Clara Ford. And with the help of seven wildly enthusiastic, highly competitive, and occasionally truthful Toronto newspapers, her murder trial would become the trial of the century, or at least the decade, across the entire nation of Canada. Huh. But just to reassure everyone who is now worried that this is going to be another sad one, <laughs> fear not. Oh, good. I promise that nothing in this story is going to go the way you expect it to. And spoilers. The most interesting part of this story is this unlikely fact that Clara Ford, a poor, black, socially marginalized, cross-dressing, pipe-smoking, probably lesbian, 19th century woman, defended herself on charges of murder in a court of law and was acquitted on all charges. Wow. Yes. Wow. Even though... She confessed. <laughs> okay. This story is bananas. Yay. It's even more bananas due to the fact that it has been almost totally forgotten for most of the last century. <laughs> but today, with the help of author and researcher Carolyn Weitzman, we are bringing Clara back. Yay. I'm Olivia Mickle. And I'm Katie Nelson. And this is What's Her Name? Fascinating Women You've Never Heard Of. Carolyn Weitzman is the author of a fantastic new book, Clara at the Door with a Revolver. <laughs> cool name. Great name. Fantastic title. And you can judge this book by its cover and its title. It's fantastic. <laughs> I'm Carolyn Weitzman, and I'm a housing policy researcher. And Clara is my fifth book, but the first book that might be of interest to folks beyond the usual academic suspects. I think we got in just at the right second on this story because I'm guessing very soon everyone is going to know Clara Ford. Mm. Because this book is amazing. First, I think we have to set the scene here. I'm a housing policy researcher by trade, having retired from being a professor of urban planning. And 20 years ago, when I was writing my PhD thesis, I was looking at 
the myths that are told about neighborhoods and how that sometimes leads to housing policy that's based on stereotypes, not on actual social conditions. So I was looking at this neighborhood that I lived in, Parkdale, over 125 years, and there were these reports saying, oh, Parkdale was a stable, middle-class residential suburb. I'd look around and I'd see 19th century industrial buildings and little one-room <laughs> workers' cottages. Oh, well, that's nonsense. I came across this article from the mid-1960s that said, sometimes people lived together who were so different that this black woman was accused of killing her former neighbor, a rich white boy. And I went, stop everything. I went and read newspapers from October 6, 1894, when Frank Westwood was shot at his front door to May 4th, 1895, when to the astonishment of everyone, Clara Ford is acquitted and there's a parade along the street to celebrate this. And I was like, this is the most amazing story yes. ever. And of course, meantime, my PhD supervisor is saying, remember your thesis, Carolyn? So I had to stop. So for 20 years, I lived in Australia. I was doing housing stuff and social policy stuff and child-friendly city stuff and all of that sort of thing. And then for various reasons, wanted to retire, wanted to move back to Canada. And I got a year's research leave and I went, ooh, what do you do with that? And I thought about Clara. And so I ended up borrowing my brother's library card, camping out in a friend's house, reading newspapers, etc. And out of that came this book that's very different from anything I've ever written. I really love these kind of stories. The ones where someone finds a rabbit hole early in their career and sort of <laughs> bookmarks it mm. and then comes back to it years or decades later and discovers that that rabbit hole was actually a gold mine. Ah. <laughs> Clara is absolutely a gold mine. She is the kind of character that novelists dream of creating. A complex, unexpected, three-dimensional, messy, complicated dream. And she's swathed in mystery from the very first moment, literally, of her life. Starting with, who is her mother? Who is her father? Where did she come from? Who is Clara Ford? We don't know her exact birth date. Very frustrating. So she was born between May and November of 61. And she was mixed race. So 1861 to an American, you go at the beginning of the Civil War, mm -hmm. right? And the legend that was told is that she was of mysterious parentage and was adopted by a spinster lady who couldn't have children named Jessie Mackay. I looked at that and went, I don't think so. Because <laughs> Jessie Mackay in the 1861 census is a servant, a nursemaid. She is working for a rich merchant. And three blocks away, there is one black man with the last name Ford in Toronto. Tori Ford was born in Peoria, Illinois, and like many black Torontonians, had come to Toronto in the 1850s, probably because of the Fugitive Slave Act. He's calling himself in the census an Episcopalian, which in Canada is an Anglican, and Jesse is also Anglican. So I hypothesize that Jesse, a 35-year-old servant, might have met Tori Ford, a 27-year-old laborer, and the result might be Clara Ford in the latter half of 1861. If Jesse was a baby farmer, a woman who was paid to take in children, that was another rumor. She was a really bad baby farmer because she was very, very poor and she only had one child. <laughs> I think it's much more likely that she was Clara's biological mother. Now, after a few years, we find Jesse McKay and little Clara living in a slum called Macaulay Town. And she is in the back of another shack that is rented by two 
Jewish tailors. Ha! Huh. And we presume this is where Clara starts her tailoring education. Oh! She will become an incredibly skilled tailor. So it's possible that she started learning those skills at the age of five, living by two Jewish tailors. Jesse and Clara are taking in laundry. Jesse and Clara, who would have been three or four at the time, taking these huge baskets of laundry, walking south for about three miles to the back of this wooden shack where there would have had to be two big wash tubs, then hang it up and then iron it and then walk with it three miles north back to Rosedale. All of that for pennies a load. This is backbreaking work. Mm. This is pretty common for women who have children or who have other complications where yeah. they can't work yeah, a regular I was job. Say, sounds like classic Victorian <laughs> single momhood. Yep. <laughs> However, Clara is attending school. She is attending the Louisa Street School, which is a slum school. She is reported as being bright and capable and curious and an excellent student. But by age 12, she's out of school and working as a barmaid at Mr. Roach's Tavern in another slum called Cabbage Town. <laughs> Mr. Roach's Tavern in Cabbage Town. She's in a Dickens novel, man. Yeah, oh, Come I could not on. make up better names for any of this if my name was Charlotte Dickens. Yes. Like, they are perfect names. Within six months, she is arrested twice for vagrancy. Vagrancy was like a status offense. If the police stopped you, you had to give an accounting of what you were doing in public space, or you were arrested for vagrancy. You cannot simply exist in public. In certain places in public. Yes. <laughs> if you look certain ways. Yeah. So being a poor black woman... Existing in public, suspicious. Uh -huh. Now, we don't know. It's just in the newspaper. Clara Ford sentenced to six months for vagrancy. At 12 years old. 12. The usual sentence is 10 days. So something's going on oh, here. Oh, wow. So again, I have to sort of hypothesize based on what I know about the era. It's possible that Claire was suspect because she was a barmaid at such a young age. It's possible that she was selling her body. It's possible that she was selling newspapers. Vagrancy is also sort of a catch-all. Sure. They could use it as a cover for, like, they know she's a pickpocket, but they can't prove it. You know, right. All kinds of things or like that. Or just harassing people. And yeah. it was very common that the police in Toronto at this time are just harassing people for being poor and uh, or black. That's not and how it both. is in Murdoch Mysteries. <laughs> I'm sorry to burst y'all's bubble. <laughs> Whatever. Things were not great. <laughs> so we don't know what happened here. We don't know where she was sent. I mean, sometimes if you get a long sentence for vagrancy, it's to help the child. You know, it's yeah. like, let's send this child to some kind of reform school or whatever. We also don't know where she ended up for those six months. It could have been the central prison. She could have been sent to the girls' home. Or most likely, she could have been sent to what were called the Magdalene, Magdalene asylums. People have probably heard about these where... Usually, girls who are pregnant or girls who are assumed to be being impure <laughs> to work the devil out of them and teach them how to work as maids. Yeah. And the irony was that the majority of women who were on the street had started in service. So she's learning skills she already knows, only not getting paid for it. But it's, it is possible, I suppose that she was in slightly more stable accommodation during that period. Clara disappears from Toronto at 13. So pretty much as soon as she gets out of prison and or the girl's home. Wow. And she later told her friends that she moved to the U.S. for several years. She lives in St. Paul, Minnesota. 
And for the first time, she lives as a man. There's two variants on those stories. In one of them, she decides that she can't get good wages as a woman, and she's able to pass as a man. She works as a hostler or a taxi driver, two jobs that were available to Black people. There's a kind of harsher variant where she moved to a number of cities, including Rochester and New York, where she was subjected to kind of assaultive examinations of her gender because she was assumed to be a boy. She was being read as a man and was subjected to several inspections because people thought she was a man trying to pretend to be a woman. What? Wow. Harassing her and inspecting. Wow. She decided, okay, well, if I'm assumed to be a boy, I'll live as a boy. There's a kind of wild rumor that she may have trained to be a pharmacist. It's possible, but unlikely with someone who really had grade school education. She returns to Toronto in 1879, pregnant with her daughter, Florence, usually known as Flora. She will never speak of how this occurred, and Flora's father remains an unknown. She works as a live-in servant for several years while her mother, Jessie, cares for Flora, who she is passing off as her daughter. Wow. Flora has a much lighter skin tone and will be told in what is meant to be a compliment that she could pass for white. Mm. Clara did not like being a servant. It's just the time when sewing machines are coming in and skilled seamstresses are less valued. So when she couldn't find work as a tailor, and that was definitely her preferred work, she worked as a waitress sometimes, she worked in hotels sometimes. In the mid-1880s, she moved again to the U.S. in search for work. She said that she married a man in Chicago. Whether she married a man or not, she returned to Toronto again with another daughter named Annie. Could be true was also a pretty common story when you return with an unexplainable child. Now it's time to introduce the rest of our cast of characters. In the 1880s, west of the city, John Clark was a land speculator in Parkdale. He was a very bad (laughs) speculator. He was a very unsuccessful land speculator. Married to Catherine Clark, had four children by his first marriage and nine children with Catherine Clark. He was a member of the Orange Lodge, who were a little bit like the Ku Klux Klan, only the object of hatred and suspicion was uh, Catholics. Almost all of the police were members of the Orange Lodge. He's ill for a long time and his family slips from comfortable middle-class existence to poverty. So they had little stables in the back that they'd had servants in, but by the early 1890s, they couldn't afford to have servants anymore. So Jesse and Flora and Annie moved into the stables. And Clara moves into the big house to help Catherine nurse John as he's dying. She also, in Catherine Clark's words, acted as the man of the house. Huh. So whatever we take that to mean... Fascinating. Clara is helping run things as a second adult in charge of the family. In the meantime, John Clark has unsuccessfully tried to sell a piece of land right next to the lakeshore, and no one is buying. It's eventually caught up in a very good deal by Benjamin Westwood. Benjamin Westwood is a boat manufacturer who came from the north of England to Toronto in the 1870s. By the 1890s, he's the father of four children. Frank Westwood, our murder victim, Ah. is the second child. Okay. Frank and Clara did not get along. When Frank was only 13 years old and Clara was 28, Clara brought to the attention of her 
friend as well as employer, Catherine Clark, that her daughters were being slandered. The Westwood boys were saying that the Clark girls got around Mm. and there was a confrontation on the porch of the Clark house where Clara accused Frank of spreading rumors. Not quite sure what happened, but certainly there was a history. Eventually, Clara moves away, largely because of this continued racist harassment, sexual harassment from Frank and other people. There are not a lot of Black people living in Parkdale, and she's tired of being a figure of attention. So she takes rooms at a boarding house, and the families are no longer in close proximity all the time, although they're still often running up against each other. Frank grows up, graduates from high school, which brings us to the night of October 6th, 1894. Here's what we know. Frank had been working during the day. Then Frank goes out with some chums. They allegedly buy some cigars, which they had to do surreptitiously because Benjamin Westwood disapproved of smoking. We don't know. It's possible whether they went into one of the five taverns along Queen Street in Parkdale. At around 1030, Frank returns home. Benjamin was upstairs in bed, sick with a cold, but Clara Westwood, who was Frank's mother, had stayed up. Frank and Clara Westwood sat for several minutes talking, and then they turned off the gas lights and went upstairs. A few minutes later, Frank went back downstairs again. Clara didn't hear the bell ring or a knock at the door, but she was slightly deaf. Frank opened the door, and Clara from upstairs heard a sound like glass breaking. And she ran downstairs, and she saw her son clutching his stomach and saying, Mama, I've been shot. Benjamin ran downstairs wearing his pajamas, took out his revolver, shot in the air to get the attention of the police. The police came and four doctors, but for all the doctors in the world, Frank had been shot in the intestines and he died three days later of blood poisoning. He was conscious for some of the next three days, and the police asked him, who attacked you? Frank said, it was a middle-aged man wearing a dark overcoat with a mustache. I didn't recognize him. The police are looking for mysterious strangers. The press is going wild. There were seven newspapers in Toronto at the time, all engaged in a furious circulation war quite happy to print any old rumor. They talked about, could it have been Frank's father, Benjamin? I don't know why. Could it have been Frank's brother, Bert? Don't really know why. Maybe jealousy? Who knows? But the most likely rumor was that Frank, a good-looking young man of 18, had been in trouble with a girl, and the girl's angry father had responded. There was an inquest held a day after Frank died, the verdict murder by person or persons unknown. It's a little baffling why the police turned to Clara so quickly. A large part of it, for sure, comes down to a perfectly ready-made villain right there at hand, Gus Clark. Gus Clark. Gus is the son of John and Catherine Clark, with whom Clara had lived while helping nurse John. Oh, okay. He is as ideal a suspect as one could hope for. Because Gus was a vibrator salesman by day and a burglar by night. Really? (laughs) Really? Oh my gosh, wow. 
isn't this great? I mean, how could anybody not have written this book by now? So now I'm going to go very briefly down the vibrator rabbit hole. Electricity is becoming common in homes. The Toronto Electric Company is looking for electrical devices that can make homes just a slightly better place. <laughs> and electrically vibrating items are being marketed using all kinds of claims. Vibrating handheld devices were sold to women as something that could beautify their faces, could provide, you know, a certain amount of circulation <laughs> and such like. <laughs> So Gus worked for his brother-in-law, who was the son of the famous Professor Hildebert Dorenwen, who ran the Paris Hair Works, a famous hairdresser. And Christian Dorenwen had a vibrator shop, and Gus worked there. But Gus was getting in trouble with the law. He had been the Westwood's next-door neighbor for some time. He is at odds with Frank, and everyone knew it. Hmm. Especially since, just a few weeks before, Gus had been trying to steal a boat from the Westwood Boathouse, Frank had caught him, and Mr. Westwood had fired a shot at him, scaring him off. Okay, then. He'd been in jail a couple of times. Clara was being treated as the man in the house because Gus was in the clink. So Gus is the police's first suspect. Especially when he disappears pretty much immediately after the murder. He'd gone north to work on a railway. He'd gotten the money to go north by stealing $30 from his mother. That couldn't help but strike everyone as pretty suspicious. Especially because his youngest brother, Percy, had just died of the croup. Ooh. And the funeral was the night of the murder. Uh -oh. And Gus was conspicuous by his absence at oh, that funeral. Oh my. As he's dying, Frank says some pretty weird things. He keeps asking, was Gus in jail tonight? Huh. You arrested Gus yesterday, right? Like, trying to figure out if Gus is on the loose. It seems pretty clear that Frank is wondering if it could have been Gus that shot him. Huh. But now, he didn't he name kind of Gus delirious. as his... He did not. He said it was a man he didn't recognize. Oh, right. However, he saw him through a 10-inch gap in the door for a split second. Oh. Huh. And fake mustaches are easy to do. So, why isn't Gus in jail? Well, you may be interested to learn that the sergeant in charge of this investigation is a member of the Orange Lodge. Uh-huh. And friends with Gus's father. <laughs> yeah. Tale as old as time. Gus is eventually brought back to Toronto for questioning. And he says, I don't know why you're looking at me. What about Clara Ford, who used to live here and who had two revolvers and hated Frank? And the police went, hmm, that sounds interesting. Ah. Uh -huh. Now, the police are being absolutely massacred in the press at this point. They are angry and humiliated, and they are happy to grab at any available straws. Mm hmm. Gus just happens to know where 14 year old Flora works. They could probably find out from her where her mother lives. <laughs> Police obligingly go to the boarding house in question. So the police come in and say that they're looking for Clara. And Flora immediately says, My mother was with me that night. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> oh, Flora. Bless her. Flora's story is that her mother and she had been to a showing of the most popular musical of the 19th century called The Black Crook. I will never more deceive you or of happiness bereave you, but I'll die and make you grieve you. Oh, you naughty, naughty men. You may talk of love and song. And the police spent about 10 minutes standing over 
14-year-old Flora before she said, Yeah, my mother had agreed to meet with me, but she didn't show up that night. So the police go down to York Street, the epicenter of Toronto's very small Black community. There were 500 Black people in a city of 250,000. The police find Clara at work at a tailor shop and start to question her. She's very upfront with them. When they ask about her clothes, she does have men's clothes. She is known for occasionally dressing in men's clothes. She takes them next door to where she lives. The police look in her trunk and they find a suit of men's clothes and a revolver and two bullets that are separate from the revolver. And they take her into the station. And what exactly happens? Well, I'll tell you what should have happened according to 19th century rules. What should have happened is that the police should have asked her for an alibi and they should have just locked her up and taken her up before the magistrate the next day. We think of the police questioning suspects and investigating the murder as normal and obvious protocol. It was absolutely not. This is not their job. They should not be doing it. They are supposed to collect the suspect and keep them in custody until the magistrate questions them. But they were so angry about the ways that the newspapers had been trashing them that they really wanted to arrive at the magistrate's court the next day with a solution tied up in a pretty little bow. You've been floundering here for six weeks, and it looks like we've got this great, great suspect. Let's get a confession out of her. They are asking her about specifically a fedora hat, which is what Frank said the man was wearing. And she said, no, but my friend Mrs. Crozier has the hat that I had. So the police trundle over to Mrs. Crozier, and Mrs. Crozier said, Oh, yeah. Clara gave us that hat that night. She was really, really upset and kind of drunk. And we saw her carrying a revolver, which she never does. This is really, really going poorly for Clara. The police come back and they bring, of course, Mrs. Crozier and her daughter. And then they, in this very 19th century way, they take an hour dinner break. You're right, sir. Of course. To be fair, they're lining up Flora, they're lining up Mrs. Crozier, and they're going to bring all of these folks into the room to confront Clara with her lies, and that should do it. And they do. And Clara maintains her innocence and maintains her innocence. And finally, at 11.30 in the evening, after being picked up at 3 o'clock, she confessed. She said that in July or August that Frank Westwood had tried to rape her. And she hadn't done anything at the time, but she vowed revenge. And the police didn't ask when or any details. Now, this confession will be absolutely pivotal. We will never actually know what actually happened here. If this was fairly or accurately recorded, if she actually did say these things in the confession, how they treated her, how all of this came about. What we do know is they absolutely should never have been taking this confession in the first place. But there are some very weird, very hard to explain things here if we are taking Clara's side. Like the matter of the fedora. This is baffling on every level. When they ask if you own a fedora, the answer is no. (laughs) Why say, well, I had one and I gave it to my friend. Why send the police to them? Uh Why do any of that, right? She's not stupid. It's so bizarre, all of this. Regardless, the police announce they have caught their man, woman. By the next day. All seven newspapers are in a fine frenzy indeed. The Crown parades Clara into the magistrate's court for her trial. Things do not improve there 
in terms of legal protocol or rule following. The magistrate, a character in his own right, George Dennison, he says, you've been accused of murder, guilty or not guilty. Now, again, this seems normal to us. It is absolutely not acceptable. The magistrate's not supposed to ask that in the case of a capital crime, because if you say you're guilty, you're going to be hanged. There's a pause. You can hear a pin drop. And it certainly sounds like Clara says guilty. So then George Dennison is like, what? And he says again, are you guilty or not guilty? And Clara says, not guilty. Perhaps she just misheard the question or misspoke, but it's a weird way to start your murder trial. There's then a delay of a week because the prosecutor is like, what is happening? And the newspapers go nuts. They immediately turn Clara into a sensation. Maybe it was inevitable that a black woman arrested for murder is going to be cast into pretty prominent recurring tropes at the time. Mm. So generally, the newspaper coverage goes in one of three handy stereotypes about black women. Either Clara is a tragic mulatto girl, the trope of the 19th century, where there's a mixed race woman who doesn't belong in the black world and she doesn't belong in the white world and she is doomed to be alone. And in this version of the story, Clara is this ignorant girl who's been tricked by the police into a false confession. That's the most pro-Clara that it gets. The second trope, and very much going strong today, is that of the angry black woman or the spurned mistress. So Frank and Clara are lovers or that Clara was attracted to Frank mm -hmm. and Frank resisted her attraction and in jealousy, she shot him. And there were all kinds of stories to make her sound like a very angry and irrational woman. Oh, where to begin? There was this one tailor who was going out of business and couldn't pay her back wages and Clara threatened to take him to the police. This becomes, Clara has threatened the life of a tailor with a pair of shears because he's unhappy about the way that she's done a scene. Clara was in the streetcar with a couple of men and they allegedly harassed her and she either hit or slapped one of them. The extra that day in the Toronto Star said, Clara has been known to exhibit the strength of two or three men. And by the very next day, there's a story saying, Clara is a professional boxer. She is a famed pugilist. <laughs> or the monster. According to one newspaper, she begins each day by drinking a quart of blood. Ooh. Which she obtains from the local butcher. Now, I don't, I, I don't even know what to do with that other than to say that Clara's mother was Scottish and they were very poor. It is possible she was making blood pudding. I don't know. Clearly, she's a vampire. Uh-huh. Another newspaper, Clara, is running around the streets stabbing people with sewing scissors. Mm-hmm. She is an out-of-control, terrifying, inhuman monster. She must be a maniac, so why even bother looking for a motive? And no one, not one of the seven newspapers, is willing to look at any details of the alleged sexual assault. At one point, the Globe says, well, it's possible that Frank did recognize her and didn't want to bring negative attention on him or his family by bringing up her name. And all the other newspapers go, how dare you make these allegations against this poor dead boy of sexual assault? In the meantime, saying that Claire is a razor-wielding vampire, you know, right, but yeah. <laughs> how dare you insult poor, poor dead Frank Westwood? All of this, all of these narratives illustrate a pretty common problem with trying to do especially local history, which is we absolutely cannot ever accept that anything printed in a newspaper is accurate. <laughs> oh, definitely. 
This is before Ida Tarbell sort of ushers in this new idea that a reporter or a paper should check something they're told before publishing yeah. it. Yeah. It's a version of... To see if something's true. Yeah. It's Victorian clickbait. Yeah, exactly. And even outside of the newspapers that are just making stuff up with no pretense of doing otherwise, even the prestigious papers are not fact-checking anything. Especially... Uh, the particular lying liar from liar land that Carolyn Weitzman mentioned here, <laughs> Hector Charlesworth, who was a young reporter at the time, immortalizing her story in a completely made up and wildly inaccurate way. Okay. And that becomes the main source for almost everybody who knows anything about Clara Ford. Classic. She is the first person that I found described in the North American newspaper as a homosexual in a two-day four-page spread, no less, by the lying liar from Liarland, who ended up writing in his memoirs the sort of official story of Clara Ford. So part of what I'm writing in this book is, you're all wrong, Hector yeah. Charlesworth. I mean, this is a guy who in his memoirs said, I printed fakes, but sometimes they were true. This is the guy you're supposed to trust. So folks who stumble on Clara now tend to go back and find these old newspaper reports. And they and say, go, these are primary sources. Yes, yeah. uh, these are my primary source material. Wow. Yeah. A cross-dressing female boxer who drinks blood and went on an unhinged murder spree all across Toronto. Amazing. That's an amazing story. Yeah. The truth is a bit harder to pin down. But, in my opinion, more interesting, though admittedly less spectacular. <laughs> Clara is hardly remembered today, but when she is remembered, in fact, last year, the Toronto Star, which is the biggest newspaper in Canada, said, this eccentric, possibly insane woman killed this sure. young boy. And I wrote the accuracy editor, Bruce Campion-Smith, and I said, hey, Bruce, let me tell you why you're wrong. He said, show me the evidence. And today, in the Toronto Star, I'm number one in new and noteworthy books to watch. So I'm the best revenge. Wow. Clara is the first person in North America to be described in the press as a homosexual. Really? It's an odd distinction to hold. Yeah. What they really meant was she dressed like a man. Was she a lesbian? Maybe. She refused several opportunities to marry. Outside of her two daughters, she never showed any interest in men or the company of men. It seems likely. We can't be sure. Was Clara a trans man? Probably not. She really only ever spoke of dressing like a man for convenience or safety. Not ever of anything about identifying as a man. But of course, that wasn't really a thought process available. So yeah. you can't be sure, but probably not. So this continues until the trial. The trial, for various reasons, doesn't happen until May of 1895. It's a long murder trial for the time. Quite often, capital crimes were decided in a day. Is it a jury trial or? It is a jury trial. Okay. She is on trial for a jury of 12 white men. So the judge is a fellow named John Alexander Boyd, who is infamous now in Canada for a decision that set back Indigenous land rights for 100 years. The fellow who was hired to lead the case for the Crown was named B.B. Osler. He managed to get the famous patriot Louis Riel, an Indigenous Métis mixed race leader, the death sentence for treason. So the two people prosecuting Clara are, at least in 21st century eyes, serious bad guys. Clara's only hope was to counter the confession. And the criminal code had just changed in Canada to allow people to testify on their own behalf. To say that all eyes were on Clara during the performance of her life would be an understatement. She went on the stand on the third day of the trial. 
Her first words to her lawyer were, could you speak up a little? I'm a bit deaf. And the courtroom laughed. And she gave many details in her testimony that just threw some really subtle shade on the police. She describes being cornered in her little boarding house room by these two police officers. And one of them says to her, I see you have men's clothes. Do you have a mustache? So she was using humor in a really kind of subtle way. It comes out really clearly to make the police look a little bit foolish. Wow. She said that the sergeant who did most of the questioning, Sergeant Reburn, had said to her, if you confess and say that he tried to assault you, there's no way you'll be convicted. And furthermore, because there's a $500 reward to find the killer of Frank Westwood, maybe you can get $500 out of this, which of course would have been a fortune to Clara. Basically, Clara says, the police told me that if I confessed and said that he had sexually assaulted me, they wouldn't convict me. And that was my best chance. So I should just do that. So I did. Yeah, that's believable. It's an entirely believable yeah. story. The police were wildly corrupt and sure. incompetent. Yeah, very, very. If it's a lie, that's a good lie. But still, nobody thinks she's actually going to get off. The confession is too damning. The circumstantial evidence is pretty overwhelming. Her alibis immediately fell apart. And the judge's summary is so anti-Clara. I mean, you'll have to read the book to believe it. So, after this very negative summing up, and the courtroom is sure that Clara's doomed. There's no way that she won't be convicted. And then the jury comes in less than an hour later and announces that she's not guilty. Pandemonium in the courtroom. Because by then, Clara turned in sort of public opinion from being this monster to actually being this kind of working class heroine. A parade of 200 people take her home. Wow. Oh my As she's leaving the court, a bookmaker reaches out and touches her skirt for luck uh-huh. because the odds uh-huh. of her getting off were so unbelievable. Wow. They take her home and throw a huge party to celebrate her being acquitted. Wow. And uh, amongst the people who show up are the jury foreman and one other juror. They were from out of town. You know, they didn't know where to get dinner. <laughs> I just show up. And, of course, the newspapers eat it up. The newspapers which had been casting her as a monster are screaming about murderer set free. The newspapers that had been propping Clara up are delighted and thrilled. Nobody seems to be giving a thought to who did it if she didn't, but I guess that doesn't matter. (laughs) Clara has her freedom, but now what does she do? She can't get work as a tailor, which to my American brain is baffling. Who doesn't want their suit made by a maybe murderer? Except she might murder you. You're standing there in your underwear, as vulnerable as it gets, with a maybe murderer? No. If this had happened in Chicago, she would have been set for life for at least for five years. I think she would have been golden in the U.S. <laughs> One of the newspapers hires her for a speaking engagement to help her pay her lawyers. Huge crowds, probably hoping she will say whether or not she did it. Sure. So she does this public speaking three weeks later with Flora at the lectern. She starts off by saying, my one piece of advice for you is never make a confession. (laughs) And, you know, the audience laughs because she was a funny woman. And she says nothing about the trial. What she talks about is how hard it is for a working woman to survive. She uses the opportunity to talk about her life and the plight of black women in general, 
how she had many, many times been homeless, trying to support her children, how difficult all of this is for women, told in a very entertaining, charming, fun stories of, you know, riding the rails, looking for work, hmm. masquerading as a man, says nothing about the murder at all. There's lots of stories about what she did after the murder. Hector Charlesworth writes his memoirs 30 years later, and in the three pages he writes about Clara, I've counted 12 lies. One of the lies that he says is that Clara went around afterwards bragging about the murder. She did not. <laughs> the claim that she became a famed socialist orator in Chicago. Ooh, okay. She did not. <laughs> what Clara did do is... Join the first all-black vaudeville troupe, Ooh. Sam T. Jack's Creole Burlesque Company. What? As a featured dancer on the cakewalk. Wow. I told you nothing was going to go the way you thought. <laughs> cool. That's Now, the cakewalk wonderful. is a form of dance. She was an excellent dancer. She was also an excellent singer, apparently. Okay. They are touring the U.S., and we can follow Clara in the newspapers for about a year. And then, poof, Clara is gone. And then, poof, Flora is gone. Poof, Annie is gone. Really? What happened? Did they change their name? Did Clara die? Did she marry? Where did she go? Hmm. What became of her? No idea. Fascinating. It's a total mystery. Probably she changed her name. And then... And her daughters yeah. with her. Whoa. But we have no idea. Does she have descendants? Yeah. Where are they? Do they know who they, they know? are? Yeah. Do they know who she was? Wow. Has her story passed down over the generations? Is someone out there going, oh... My, My great-grandmother. Great there were rumors she was a murderer. That she was, yeah. That she drank a bucket of blood every morning. <laughs> wow. I mean, she saved up on the vaudeville tour, and then she bought a farm, and they lived happily ever after. Obviously. Yeah, it could be. She could have changed her name and continued performing with the vaudeville for years. Set up a tailor shop. Yeah, anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. She could have Died. married. She could have... <laughs> Died. Mm -hmm. We have no idea. Okay, but did she do it? Ah, an excellent question. And after reading the book and all of Carolyn's incredible research, I am pleased to say that I have a definitive answer to that question. Ooh. For you. The answer is maybe. <laughs> Helpful. Thank you. Excellent. I don't know. <laughs> I think she did it. She did so, it. There's so much information in the book that I really, really recommend. There's a great sort of roundup of all of the options. Mm -hmm. The very reasonable suspicions of Gus Clark. Carolyn Weissman suggests that it's possible Frank had gotten Flora pregnant. And that's actually the motive. It's entirely possible Frank was killed by another angry parent whose kid he got pregnant. Sure. He had a pretty bad reputation, and it was just bad timing. Interesting. There does seem to be too much weirdness from Clara that night to explain. Yeah. Maybe this is... Flora did it. Flora. Oh! That's where I'm going with it. Uh -huh. That's oh. what popped yeah, into my because brain. Because Flora is so quick to give the alibi, and yeah. then Clara hears about it, and she's like, I confess, because... What if Flora did it? And took what her if... mom's hat and her mom's gun. Yeah. Wore her mom's male clothes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Put yeah. on a fake mustache. Totally. And then when Flora tells Clara what happened, when they meet at the opera house, uh -huh. Clara uh -huh. immediately says, my daughter cannot go to jail. I'm going to yeah, go yeah, yeah. make myself look guilty and make and this huge scene I'll at the closures. And then I'll talk myself and... out of it. Yeah. Wow. Baffling. It, uh, nothing else explains... The fedora uh -huh. bit to me. Yeah. That just does it's not really make sense. interesting. Especially when you learn that she wore the fedora to court. <laughs> that <laughs> just seems like rubbing it in their face. <laughs> wow. This is great. I love this. 
There's just one teensy tiny problem with this theory. Okay. Flora's boss swore that she was at work when the murder happened. Ah! Ah. But no good true crime enthusiasts allow mere facts to get in the way (laughs) of enjoyable speculation. So... Carry on, I guess. Uh. (laughs) We don't know. It is not unlikely that she did it. On balance, I think the most likely scenario is that it was Gus. No, that's boring. All of these stories seem pretty unlikely. Yeah. I have to admit, I'm slightly pleased that I can't be sure. That gray area is a bit more fun. You love landing and we don't know. Answers are boring. Yeah. Well, in this instance, in my mind, I'm resolved. I, You're resolved on floor. Yes. All right. She she did what? it. It's all clear. <laughs> what Clara's story, I think, does give us is an almost unprecedented and really fascinating peek into the workings of Race, gender, oh, yeah. poverty, policing, sex, the media, yeah. the nearly impossible double binds that were common for most black women in North America in the 19th century. Yep. The lower classes. So many things here that very rarely get talked about yeah. or looked at. Yeah. And instead of a squeaky clean, proper Victorian moral lesson, we find triple generation single mothers Mm -hmm. brutal violence and racism deep and lasting friendships casual migration a world turned upside down by industrialization and then war Mm. a nuanced complex social reality Mm. and a wildly fascinating bafflingly complex entirely unexpected protagonist who made herself the hero of her own story claimed her life and her rights loudly and unashamedly Saved her own life, (laughs) and who, as Carolyn Weitzman perfectly narrates her off the page of our story, goes dancing off into the sunset. Huge thanks to Carolyn Weitzman for bringing us the incredible story of Clara Ford. If you would like to learn more, on our website, you can find the brand new book, Clara at the Door with a Revolver, as well as links, photos, newspaper clippings, resources, and more. If you've enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review wherever you listen to podcasts, or consider becoming a patron of What's Her Name. Go to our website at whatshernamepodcast.com and click Donate. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, where we post lots of photos each week. Our theme song was composed and performed by Daniel Foster Smith. Our interns are Kira Maxwell and Katie Boucher. What's Her Name is produced by Olivia Mickle and Katie Nelson, and this episode was edited by Olivia Mickle.